How do we start after a week like the one we've just had? With all eyes on the knife-throwing, backstabbing arena that is Westminster, the government and the cabinet, it can be easy to forget that other things have actually been happening this week. In fact, the only place where we saw a larger mass exodus than in the cabinet was north of the border, as one by one players pulled out of Alex McLeish's Scotland squad faster than you could say, Trees has got it a bit tough, hasn't she? Well, listener, worry not, because we have got you covered and all the sport ready to be delivered in as much clarity as the issues over the Irish border. Oh wait, that's not a good thing. Welcome to Sport Spiel. Right, no more bre- references now to Brexit, I promise. Welcome everyone to episode 31. I'm here as always, as is my podcast partner in crime, Will Moulton. Hello. Good morning, good morning. I apologise for my lack of enthusiasm in my voice this morning. It's been a long week. I've been up since half past five covering our girls out in China. So I'm a little bit tired. Just of life as well, because Brexit and just... (laughs) Everything that's going on. It's just difficult to be enthusiastic about anything at the moment. Just off life. Well, I try and focus on other stuff, which is what I've tried to do this week and, and turn my attention onto other things. Because lo and behold, since we're sporting podcasts and everything, I made my long awaited return to fencing. Finally. I ache like I've never ached before. <laughs> How did it go? Um, surprisingly well, considering I haven't picked up a sword for about two years. Um, but what I will say is the standard was not the highest at that club. Burn. So, I mean, considering I beat one of them 15-2, and I'm two years out. This I'd is like when you turn around and say it was an eight-year-old. He was 36. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway, I know the mo on your face is coming on quite nicely. Yes, unfortunately, I haven't had a trim, so I've just got general stubble all round, so the mo isn't quite... As, as prominent as prominent as it could be but it's going well if you would like to sponsor then links will be on my twitter page uh it's been a good week long session of cheer on monday lots of throwing and catching of people as you do um, yeah and then we've got a lot of exciting things coming up at work obviously as i just said the women are out of the champs trophy in china at the moment first time they've played as gb in a tournament since the olympics which is exciting and then our men going out to india for their world cup next week which is really exciting opportunity. New coach in charge, new players in the squad. I think they've got an outside chance of getting through to the final. Happy days. And yeah, it's been busy in podcast headquarters as well because while it's been three weeks since we last met up to do a podcast, we've released three in the middle, three specials in that time. So it's all guns blazing. However, on to today's full length show, and it is jam packed full of stuff as always. First up, we have a feature interview with Natalie Jackson, the co-founder of Totally Runnable and one of the brains behind the hashtag C-Sporty, B-Sporty campaign. In part two, we have the news roundup, a mix of the important headlines in sport that may have passed you by. And we also have our discussion section, which this week focuses on the change at the top of the Premier League pyramid. Namely, Richard Scudamore is out as chief executive, while Susanna Dinage is in. All that is to come, but first, we turn to our feature interview, which this week is brought to you by Will Moulton. Indeed, and it's short, but very, very sweet this week, this interview. Really, really enthusiastic person for sport and just for life is Natalie, real breath of fresh air. We talk about her charity, Totally Runnable, which she and former Olympic sprinter Emily Freeman set up uh, to basically use running as a tool to inspire women and young kids to either get active and just to instill life skills in them like self-confidence um, they're doing a fantastic job there and then also more recently they launched the hashtag C Sporty B Sporty campaign a petition to get basically more women's sport in the media they did some research and found that 3% of photos across a year across a period of a year were of, of spo- uh, photos uh, depicting sport were of women which is frankly ridiculous um, as someone who's big on trying to increase overall media coverage of women's sport, this really struck a chord with me. So I really want to help share their message. Make sure you give it a listen. Uh, fantastic interview. And we were lucky that she was traveling in the car with her baby and her baby didn't wake up until just after we pressed stop. <laughs> and then the baby started screaming. 
You're listening to Sportspiel, available on Audio Boom, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So first of all, I guess if you could just des- describe the inspiration behind Totally Runnable and, and what exactly it is you guys do. And of course, and is that something then a lot a lot of women were experiencing at the time in that the reason why they weren't taking up sport is just because there was sort of no inspiration seemingly to, to, to take it from? Just go. 
girls get sent around sport are, are awful, really. You just you see so much. Like 90% of sport on TV is men's sport. Um, girls from as young as age seven are, so some government researchers said girls were beginning to doubt their sporting ability at age seven. We then did our own research and we found the difference that we looked at year three, four, five, and six. And even from year three, then girls were 22% less likely to call themselves very sporty than boys. And a lot of your research as well has looked at media stuff and that, this has sort of led to the hashtag C Sporty, B Sporty campaigns. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a, a little bit more about that. So, um, C Sporty, B Sporty came about really because we were talking to schools about the messages that were sent to girls. Um, and schools were saying that they were getting sent to them about the Yeah, it's re- really worrying stats. So, with with the whole hashtag B Sporty C Sporty campaign, exactly, if you could just explain, you know, exactly what it is and, and the, what you're really trying to achieve from it as well. So, C Sporty B Sporty is about if you can't see it, you can't be it. So, if girls aren't seeing women in the media being sporty, they find it much more difficult to think of themselves as sporty. Obviously, we know from our previous research, girls from age seven onwards, um, probably younger, although we've only started at year three, are um, not as confident about their sporting ability as boys are. And I'm not saying boys have got it easy. You know, there are a lot of issues around boys, um, and separate things around emotions and mental health and that kind of thing. But actually, girls do have an issue in sport in that they're not seeing the role models that they should be seeing. So, C40B40 is about calling for the media uh, for sport in the media to be more gender equal. It's not any more complicated than that. It's literally saying this needs to be more gender equal because 2.9% of photos of sport in the newspapers are women, which means that the rest aren't women. And how has it gone down so far? I mean, I've looking through social, I've seen a number of athletes have already been pictured holding the hashtag C Sporty, B Sporty sign. Has it you know, gone down and been even more respected than perhaps you initially thought? It's gone down so well so far, yeah. We just thought, well, what can we do? Um, we read a quote in, um, so Lucy Ann Holmes was the founder of the No More Page 3 campaign, and she's written a book, and the opening quote of that is um, something along the lines of, I I thought somebody should do something about this, then I realised I am somebody. So we started it thinking, we 
just need to have something happening here because we saw a space, there wasn't anything going on. There was specifically calling for sport in the media to be more gender equal. So we started a petition on change.org. Uh, it's change.org slash P slash C40 B40. And we thought, let's see what happens. And we've had a brilliant response. We have had um, world champions, Olympians, Paralympians, um, governing bodies of sport, the Association for PE. We have had all kinds of people supporting it. Um, we've had Hannah Cockcroft, she's, she's a 10 time world champion. We've had Lizzie Arnold, she's a two time Olympic gold medalist. Um, I think it's really struck a chord with a lot of people. But actually, we've had a lot of people that aren't necessarily Olympians, Paralympians, world champions. Actually, a lot of, a lot of the public and you know, people like me are just as passionate about it as athletes, which is, I think, something that, that we thought would be the case, but really the amount of support and sharing that we've had has, yeah, has been brilliant. And in terms of the support and sharing... Is potentially social media a, a really strong way forward of actually getting more media coverage and more pictures of women is it, rather than going through sort of mainstream newspapers? Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And absolutely, I would love um, for social media to become a place where people are seeing more women being sporty because it is something that, you know, normal people can, can contribute to. I fully understand it, you know, newspapers and press offices and that kind of thing are waiting for um, there to be a change in attitude before they're going to print more things and social media is the place that we can do that absolutely and finally going back to totally runnable you know it's been going three four years already you've done some incredible work where where are you looking to to go to next with with the the, the organization And what what are the sort of reactions when people when you go into schools and you go into to places of education things like that? What are the sort of reactions you get from the from the girls and the women? Um, I think um, the way you go in, really, we're not going in and, and telling people how to do things. We're not going in and, and telling people they're doing things wrong. We're just showing really what's going on. We're highlighting the messages that are being sent to girls, and we are doing positive things to build girls' confidence in sport. Um, we get some brilliant reaction from, from the girls who come on our courses. You know, some some of them consider themselves sporty, some of them don't. Um, but I think the majority of girls that are coming on our courses and, and female school staff or, or adults that are on our, our adult courses, they are coming away from the course feeling more confident. And it is something that is designed to go into the rest of our lives as well. Do you know, when, when I'm delivering the courses, I get something out of every course that I go on. You know, you think, oh, yeah, I can definitely do that in, in this area and, and it, yeah it's not really about running we use running as the tool because it, it's useful it's family's background it's my background and we can see how it um how it links into what we're doing but actually the yeah the trick is it's not really about running it's about confidence in the rest of your life so yeah we, we always get a brilliant reaction and um and I, I genuinely believe that we are doing things that make a difference to the lives of people who come on our courses you know if we weren't we wouldn't be doing it it's about it's about going, going back to where we started, really. And I remember believing things to be impossible that I now know are perfectly possible. And if everybody knew that things were possible that they thought were impossible, what, what else could we do? You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it opens up your world, doesn't it? It does, not that is the perfect quote to end the interview on. So. Well, it's a big thank you to Natalie, as we always say to our guests, and we hope everyone enjoyed the interview, and it's obviously a very, very good message to get behind. Now, it's time to do some news, as we take a look at some of the headlines that you may not have seen, but we believe you probably should have. It's three stories from each of us this week. As always, we'll take it back and forth, and Will is on the timer, so away I go, I suppose, this week. The first story from me... 
uh, follows on from the news roundup in episode 29, where I talked about Stockholm and the city council leaders not wanting to bid for the 2026 Winter Olympics. What I also said was Calgary and Canada would be holding a vote to see if the people supported a bid for the Games from them. The bid leaders were very confident at the time. The vote was held on November the 13th, and, well, what do you know, the city's residents voted no by 56.4%. The spiral in costs underlined most people's concerns. It was anticipated to be around five billion Canadian dollars, or three million pounds, um, but it's another huge blow to the IOC. That leaves just two bidders remaining for the 2026 Games, Stockholm and the joint milan cortina Dampezzo bid. Supporters of Calgary's No campaign celebrated the victory with city councillor Sean Chu, saying, I think that people had enough of the establishment telling us what to do and what to think. They tell you to spend millions and billions. They say it's good for you. Well, this another example of elections. We don't really know what's going to come out of them, do we? Um, but it's a real terrible state of affairs right now for the 2026 Winter Olympics and where they're actually going to end up. I think with Canadians especially, they're still reeling from the financial implications of the Montreal Olympics, even though that was 30, 40 years ago. That took them such a long time to pay off and it caused a significant had a significant financial impact on that country. So, you know, you can understand why they've said no. But it's worrying. This is not just a Winter Olympics problem, this is a Summer Olympic problem as well. Your two minutes was almost up, so now it's my turn. And we're going to go on to a nice positive note now. And something that happened just last night as we record. So England's women sealed their place in the semi-finals of the Women's T20 Cricket World Cup with a convincing victory over South Africa. So they qualify with a game to spare. That game is against the West Indies to see who tops the group. But the real star of the show was once again Anya Shrubsole, the hero of the 50 over World Cup win in 2017. Struck a ha- with a hat trick last night, two bowls and one court. Um, another fantastic bowling performance from the entire team, but Anya obviously with that hat trick really shone. It was she's only the second player ever to take a hat trick at a T20 World Cup, the first woman. The other player being Brett Lee in 2007, so she's in very esteemed company. England have done all right so far. One game washed out, two convincing victories. The bowlers really look really good. The two recruits, Lindsay Smith, Kirsty Gordon, impressing with the ball. Tammy Beaumont, Danny White looked pretty good with the bat last night. So it's not, a, you know, not an outrageously good start, but a positive start for the girls and good to see them through to the semis. It was the amount of attention that it um, raised from people as well, and people were actually keeping tabs on that. Which again, like I think you tweeted it yesterday, shows just how much that game is growing particularly after the World Cup win as well yeah it's brilliant and with the women's rugby as well obviously I was at the game the quarter international last week where they beat the USA and to come home and see the amount of support and noise being made about it on Twitter you know those two games in women's football are really really starting to grow at an exceptional rate it's really exciting happy days for my second story I'm going across the Atlantic and I thought I would bring up an important moment regarding concussion, which various sports have issues with at the moment. On Monday, that's November the 12th, the NHL, the National Hockey League, announced a tentative $18.9 million settlement with more than 300 retired players who sued the league and accused it of failing to protect them from head injuries or warning them of the risks involved with playing. Ice hockey is obviously a very violent sport, and the concussion is and has been a major talking point for years, This particular lawsuit was the largest the league had faced, but the NHL, as it has for years, did not acknowledge any liability for the players' claims in the proposed settlement. And it can terminate the deal if all 318 players don't elect to participate. This settlement is significantly less than the billion-dollar agreement that was reached by the NFL and its former players uh, on the same issue of head injuries. Also, in addition to the cash payment, the NHL settlement includes neurological testing and assessment for the players, which is paid for by the league, up to $75,000 in medical treatment for the players who test positive on two or more tests, and a common good fund for retired players in need, including those who did not participate in the litigation, which is worth $2.5 million. Ex-player Daniel Carcillo, 
who is one of the people who initiated that lawsuit in, at the start, he urged players not to accept the settlement, saying on Twitter that players would be forced to see the same NHL and NHLPA doctors to determine if they'd be eligible for treatment. I think the, the general reaction from it is it's a lopsided win for both sides, as in it's reduced the amount of damage for the league and the league owners, but Gary Bettman, who's the commissioner of the league, he said the lawsuit had no merit. So... Another interesting tale in concussion, but it remains such a serious issue that a lot of executives across all sports seem to push to the side. The timing on that was just brilliant. Sure, stopped it. (laughs) But yeah, no, it's concussion is uh, such a hot topic of debate at the moment. Something I've got a lot of personal experience of, both in my job and personally as well it's it just feels like a lot of things being done at the moment are reactive rather than proactive exactly so something needs to change there one of the big since we're on this concussion topic one of the big stories really hit home i think about uh, probably about a year ago now paul career who was uh, an ice hockey player for the anaheim ducks and there's a classic clip of him in the stanley cup final in 2003 in game six where he gets knocked out cold by someone is on the floor amazing piece of commentary i urge anyone to look on youtube and find it he goes off understandably and comes back 11 minutes later and takes to the ice after being knocked out cold and scores great moment but he did an interview last year he's since retired and he can't remember any of that game or any of the game that they played two days later so he can't remember the end of the final likewise he can't remember the following days after that and that, that highlights the scary fact of concussion. And it's a large part of why he's now a recluse. He doesn't take part in any ice hockey whatsoever. He's not involved in the sport. He just keeps himself to himself. That sums up the seriousness to it yeah, well, for look, me. Concussion is a strange one because everyone assumes that you get it by being knocked out. But quite often, you know, players... I was, I've only, of my six concussions, I've only been knocked out with one of them. Um, the, the two hockey girls, Nick White and Shona McCallum, they were, neither of them were knocked out, but you can also be knocked out and not have concussion. It's, it's such a, a broad injury, there's so many potential symptoms, but... You and know, really you, delicate as well. You, you speak of the, the impact it had on that ice hockey player there, so I've been very close with Shona. Um, obviously we had her on the podcast while she was going through concussion. Um, one of the players I get on best with, and it's been, it's been really difficult to see, to see you know the ups and downs that she's had and not being able to do anything about it personally to help her it's yeah the, if the she's pretty much at the end of the line now she's very very close to returning but they're just being very very cautious of that which is rightly so but yeah it's she just had it wasn't a knock he was knocked it was a fairly big whack to the head but you know she was still able to walk herself off and everything and when we were initially chatting she was thinking oh, i'll only be out for six weeks and i'll be back that was in February. We're now in November. She's still not back playing full time. So it's it's just such a an under researched and injury that we just don't know enough about. Um, so like I said previously, we need to be reactive. We need to be trying to find ways of preventing it or dealing with it when it happens, rather than reacting to it already happening. Yeah. So things that have gone in years gone past. Right, on to my second story, and we're going to go for a much more positive angle. So we've already had one inspirational athlete from me and Anja Shrubsol. We're now going for an inspirational referee in Sarah Cox, who on the 5th of November made history by becoming the first woman to referee a top-flight English game as she oversaw Northampton 15, Wasps 14 in the Premiership Rugby Cup. She also officiated, interestingly enough, at Rio 2016, doing the women's sevens. Um... So yeah, the first female referee in this country to take charge of such a prestigious men's match. She's not the first though. Um, Joy Neville is uh, pretty much the trailblazer for rugby union female referee. She was an assistant in a professional European match, the first woman ever in 2016. She's taken part. She's taken charge of numerous men's games in various leagues for the first time. She also became only the second woman to take charge of a men's international and was named 2017 World Rugby Referee of the Year. So Joy Neville and Sarah Cox making huge waves in rugby union and also Caitlin Beavers as well in rugby league became the first woman to ever officiate a rugby league game at Wembley this year when she looked after an under 12 boys match. She's also just been picked to play for England for the first time at the age of 18. So, you know, three fantastic women here showing that 
you know you don't we don't just need women on the pitch playing we also need women officiating and these women are real trailblazers they're all performing really really well they all deserve to be there so let's hope we see more of them in the future yes i feel your stories are taking a more inspirational turn than mine are taking. I'm, on a, I'm in a positive mood this morning despite the fact i can barely keep my eyes open well to bring everyone back down to earth again my final story um actually comes from a, a pretty phenomenal piece of writing by the independence jonathan Liu. Uh, which it was on sport and Saudi Arabia, namely how that country is using sport to sanitise its image. A few weeks ago, Brazil and Argentina played each other in a friendly in Jeddah. In September, the city played host to the climax of the World Super Series Boxing, where Callum Smith, Smith beat George Groves to become the WBA Super Middleweight Champion. And in December this year, Riyadh will host the opening race of the Formula E season, and the month after that, Juventus will play AC Milan in the not-so-Italian, but n- nonetheless Italian Supercoppa. Additionally, recently a tennis exhibition match which had been scheduled for December between Novak Djokovic and Rafa Nadal in Jeddah was postponed due to Nadal's ankle injury, but there's still time for the pair to be quizzed over that decision uh, considering what has been happening in Saudi Arabia recently. You have what's going on in Yemen, where, according to many experts, the Saudis are carrying out war crimes there under the the guise, if you like, of fighting Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. And recently, we also have what happened to journalist Jamal Khashoggi at the Saudi consulate in Turkey. And again, that really demonstrates the power of sport on the political stage because there's also the willingness of those in power as well to... Because they keep choosing, it seems, to line their pockets rather than actually turn any sort of attention to what is going on in Saudi Arabia. I was going to make that exact point. Why do tournaments, races, organisations, games keep going to places like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, when there is such strong suspicion of a lot of wrongdoing? Like, Why do we keep taking events there why why would you want to host the italian supercoppa in saudi arabia what is the point money interesting the italian supercoppa has also been hosted in qatar and libya so it mm. looks like it's going on a real tour of you know the, the human rights based <laughs> countries let's hope no one from any of those countries listens to this yep shall we finish on a final positive note let's, yes let's bring the mood back up So as I mentioned earlier on, this week England Hockey announced their men's squad heading out to India for the World Cup starting later this month. Really interesting squad selection, both from an internal perspective and also from an external perspective. So first of all, we've got two players who only made their international debuts in October in Zach Wallace and Jack Waller heading out as part of the 18, while Rhys Smith, who also made his debut at the same time, is heading out as a travelling reserve. Will Callan as well, only made his international debut back in June. So you've got four youngsters here with barely inter- any international experience going out to a World Cup, going to be taking on the world's best. Really, really exciting, attacking, talented players, though there's a lot of good stuff to come from them. Really keep an eye out for Zach Wallace as well going forward. Conversely, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, we have the legend that is Barry Middleton, going to be playing at his fourth World Cup. So if we just go through some footballers who've played at four World Cups, we've got Cafu, Ike Casillas, Andreas Iniesta, Maradona, Lionel Messi, Pele, Sergio Ramos, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Sir Bobby Charlton. So he's in pretty high esteem, highly esteemed company there. Just in the football world, that's not taken into account any other sport. In a group, England are with Australia, Ireland, and China. So it is likely they'll be battling for one of the top two spots. They've come fourth at the last two World Cups. And this time, can they go one further? It's going to be Really interesting to see. They've got Danny Kerry, the former women's head coach, now in charge. They're playing a slightly different brand of hockey, but it's really exciting to watch. Cannot wait to catch them out on BT Sport starting on the 28th of November, I think the tournament begins. As well as that, obviously, our women playing as GB in the Champions Trophy. Two all draw with China early this morning. Missing several key players, so Shona and Nick White, as um, mentioned previously. Alex Danson, Maddie Hinch are also missing. But we had three debutants today in Tessa Howard making her international debut, and then Erica Sanders and Sabi Heesh making their GB debuts. You've also got Amy, Amy um, Tennant and Sarah Jones, Amy Costello, Sarah Robertson, a lot of 
exciting young players in the squad. And it'll also be the first time Great Britain play the Netherlands since that Olympic final, which will be a big game. How many caps does Barry Middleton have now? Barry has around 415. That's, that's the mental. world record is 453. So if he keeps going to Tokyo, the likelihood is he could break that record. Yes, it's just a staggering number. That's when he keeps going to Tokyo, because we all know he's not giving the game up. Exactly. And uh, that's the end of the news section. Uh, more to come after this. Follow Sports Bill Pod on Twitter, Facebook and on Instagram or go to our website, sportsbillonline.com. Moving on to this episode's discussion section, and we are turning to the Premier League, where it is all change at the top of the pile. This week, Susanna Dinge was named as the new chief executive of the Premier League, replacing Richard Scudamore, who is stepping down next month after 19 years at the helm. As a result of the appointment, Dinge will become the most senior female leader in the world's major professional sports leagues. But who exactly is she? Well, Dinej very much comes from a television background and will be joining from media organisation Discovery, where she was the global president of the Animal Planet channel. Prior to joining Discovery in January 2009, she worked for 10 years at Channel 5 and she started her career at MTV. In terms of football, or in the football industry rather, she doesn't really have any experience, but she is a Fulham season ticket holder. Of course... Her appointment was overshadowed somewhat by the £5 million leaving gift Richard Scudamore looks likely to get from the uh, 20 Premier League clubs. We'll touch on that a little bit later. But first, let's look at Dinage and her appointment. Firstly, what does her appointment say about the league's priorities? Broadcast deals. I've got TV! Exclamation mark. The- followed by money! Exclamation mark. So, yeah. Basically, she's her her expertise is in TV, the Premier League, as we've all seen in recent years, are charging more and more or expecting more and more for broadcast deals from the likes of Sky and BT Sport. She's very very good at this, so naturally, the cynics the cynics amongst us are going to say that's that is their focus rather than ticket sales, rather than grassroots, rather than BAME representation in football. Rather Should that worry things. your match-going fans then? Because is the Premier League becoming more and more geared to a product you can sell on the TV rather than a product you can sell to fans in the stadium? That is seemingly the way it's going, from my perspective anyway. I've got no- There's no- nothing against her appointment. I think it's a fantastic move. It's just a shame that, that is TV is now becoming the focus. But if that's where the money is... But then you can see mm. why they're doing it. Well, one of the things I'll say as well is a number of good old Twitter trolls um, suddenly <laughs> started piping up and saying, oh, she hasn't kicked a ball before. I was like, give me a break. I, there's no, no point in that. I, I don't have issue with her appointment, like you said. And obviously she hasn't taken uh, the post yet. She will be assuming that role at the start of 2019. Uh, and obviously a lot remains to be seen as to what she actually will do in her position. But there are other things that she probably should have to tackle other than the TV rights deal. The fact that she has such an extensive background and experience in the broadcast media does highlight what you're saying. That's where all the money is, essentially, a large part of it. And it is a key reason why all of those clubs are as wealthy as they are now. But let's not also not forget she's got to keep club owners happy. If you look at what's happening with the rumours of a European Super League starting, for example, and there's also a whole ton of other factors, be it Brexit, be it whatever, um, that she has to actually keep an eye on. One of the interesting things I found, though, is that because she's a Fulham season ticket holder, and season tickets and tickets put in general are not cheap at Fulham, considering where they are, would that actually make her a better candidate to see the fans' point of view? On something like ticket sales, yeah, yeah, she's she is a fan herself. She she knows what fans are experiencing. She knows what fans want. So hopefully she'll be able to then channel that into her role and and alongside making it, you know, m- making more money through broadcast deals, also make it a more entertaining value for money day out for fans. So 
would like to think that you know she'll be a good job. But I don't actually envy her. You know, it's a tough because, job. because she's got a lot of stuff to deal with at the moment. You know, Brexit, European Super League. Well, that brings me on then to my next point. Of stuff. What are her biggest challenges? I have a list of them here, if I can find. So, <laughs> Brexit. There's obviously the grassroots debate, the talk of bringing in a cap. Um, on well not, a, not a cap on the number of foreign internationals, but more you have to play a certain number of homegrown players in your teams. So, there's that, that big debate. Fan relations with the the Premier League and their clubs as well. Player welfare is a big thing that's being talked about at the moment in terms of where they go after the game, you know, mental health within the sport, all of that she's got to deal with. I think there was um, a piece that came out earlier this week that said if the PFA wasn't reformed, it, it's going to become obsolete, and that came from a Swindon player, uh, Daniel Perkis, who is the chairman of that. But again, that's something that she's going to have to, to deal with. Agents as well. Safe standing is another one. Gambling as well, which has been in the news recently, which saw Tracy Crouch resign because of the whole gambling machine thing and VAR as well. So there's a, which, lot, there's a lot of stuff yeah. that she's going to be walking straight into. Which VAR is coming in now from the 2019 season onwards. Um, again, you mentioned the player welfare thing. She will also be in post when the report is published on the historic sex abuse scandal that has been going on for a few years now. Um, bring it back to the European Super League as well because that was obviously a big story when it got um, when the most recent story rather was published in Der Spiegel I think it was in that there are these European giant clubs threatening to start their own breakaway league and that comes into the point that I was mentioning before in that she really has got to somehow please and keep on side the wealthy powerful owners of those big clubs in the league to stop that happening because for me I think the European Super League would be the worst thing to happen to football in quite some time and the guy the businessman behind that Charlie Stilitano remember that name who is also the man behind the the Champions Cup you see during pre-season the International Champions Cup same guy really don't like what his plans and what he has in, uh, in the pipeline to carve up football purely for money-making purposes. You've got a lot of... You, I think what this guy is forgetting, that there's a lot of fans who don't support those big teams. And that will cause uproar amongst them. But the fact is, I think, was it Arsenal have come out in the last couple of days and said, we're not interested in it. I think Chelsea have previously said they're not interested in the Super League. And the interest, from what I've read and understood, correct me if I'm wrong, seems to be from teams outside of the Premier League a lot of the sort of Premier League clubs are fairly seem to be fairly happy where they are so she's just got to maintain that but also you know keep rewarding them the same as the likes of the Real Madrid's and the Barcelona so they don't become disillusioned it's, it's going to be a very difficult balancing act because she's then also got to think about the other teams and parachute payments and keeping the Football League on side because there was a story breaking this week 15 of the 24 current championship clubs are threatening to quit the Football League because of their rubbish TV deal so obviously she doesn't deal directly with them, but she's got to try and help them out as well because they're aiming all to be Premier League teams. So, she, again, rather her than me, yeah. trying to keep everybody happy. And you're not going to please everyone, but hopefully she'll just keep the English clubs on side, keep the Premier League you know, as a financially stable, profitable even league that teams are more than happy to play in and, and don't want to break away and then like most of these talks the Super League talk will eventually die down I, I can't see it coming to fruition the, cyn the cynical side of me always thinks oh if there's enough money at stake anything is possible um, before we move on from Dinesh herself we'll final point on the TV deal aspect because it's obviously the most important most significant aspect of her appointment um, and the big clubs have been trying for quite some time to get a bigger share of the TV rights deal saying that because they're the big clubs, they pull in more viewers than the other clubs do. Um, like you say, difficult balancing act. But interestingly, her former colleague at Discovery is Peter Hutton, who is now the head of sport at Facebook. And Facebook are obviously trying to uh, dive into that live sporting market and seeing the way viewer um, patterns are changing. More people are watching online now than ever before. It's not simply a Sky BT Sport duopoly anymore could be interesting to see if anything with Facebook maybe happens later down the line or any other streaming service. You look at La Liga's deal with, I think it's 11 sports now, um, and you can only watch it online. Same with Serie A now. 
the Premier League may go down that online streaming. It's interesting platform. seeing the the Lionesses games recently being streamed on Twitter. I think they were also shown on BT Sport, um, but they were also streamed live on Twitter. They seem to go down really well. For me, it's frustrating because I like sitting down in front of a big screen to watch something rather than do it on my phone, but that's just my personal preference. And I don't think there's any issue in going down that streaming service on Facebook as long as that's only still a minority of the games and that the majority is still shown on proper screens where people can gather around in a bar and watch or at home wherever you want to but just keep it a little traditional time will tell now outgoing Richard Scudamore time to talk about him because the arguably bigger news rather than than Dinage's appointment was the five million pound parting gift um, that Scudamore would be getting with each of the 20 Premier League clubs asked to contribute £250,000 towards it. A lot of the clubs were supportive of it. I know you have a quote from um, Spurs chairman Daniel Levy to come. My quote here from West Ham co-chairman David Gold, uh, he backed the payment saying, Richard Scudamore deserves everything he gets. This is all very appropriate and we're all very pleased. But understandably, considering the large sum of money we're talking about, a lot of fans were in uproar when that news broke. And a lot of Spurs fans will have been in uproar after this quote from Daniel Levy, who came out and said, we're all very supportive of the payment. He has unique knowledge and experience, which is going to be of ongoing benefit to the Premier League. It's absolutely a fair payment and the clubs were behind it. I think he has a point in that Richard Scudamore has done a fantastic job. But this is coming from a man who didn't spend any money on any players during the transfer window who is now willing to give £250,000 to a bloke. How are fans going to think? Really? like he's, he's come out and said that and he's not thinking how the fans are going to react in the slightest. And they're his customer. They're the people who, not keep him in a job, but they're the people he should be trying to please. And just to give away, I mean, two hundred and fifty grand. okay, that's not going to buy you many players anymore in the current world but to, to spend just to give that money a blow and say oh here's a present for you I mean I got a bonus from England hockey during the week and it wasn't even close to being that money a level of money and I was like oh I was quite happy with that but this guy already gets a bonus this is a bonus bonus on top of his two and a half million pound a year salary like he's done brilliant things but really with Bruce Buck, who came up with this idea, just what was going through his mind? <laughs> well, that's the thing. If you look at it from a commercial side of view, Richard Scudamore's done a fantastic thing, fantastic in his role in his 19 years as chief executive. But that's the thing. It's a PR disaster, essentially, for the league. You mentioned Daniel Levy and the lack of signing players, but I think mainly people's focus is on the grassroots side of things. Grassroots football is struggling badly in this country you look at the state of the facilities you look at the state of pitches up and down the country and £250,000 obviously won't get you much of a player these days at the top level but it will get you one hell of a great facility at a grassroots level if clubs are suddenly just going to throw that amount of money as a parting gift to someone who is already as rich as he is to throw another angle on that the mirror sport ran this article it would be that payment would be enough to hand out over 11,000 free season tickets across the Premier League as well so think how many children families up and down the country who can't afford to go to regular Premier League games because the tickets are sky high as they as they are which we've talked about think how many of them would be able to then experience Premier League football live if the clubs are as happy to throw out that kind of money as they are we should point out, though, that not all the clubs are happy about that. I think Leicester. Yeah, it's five, oh, five clubs. Club. Leicester Wolves, mm -hmm. Brighton, Cardiff, and one other, I think, um, weren't, weren't massively happy. And it's just, I think the frustrating thing about it is that we know that this goes on behind closed doors in other places all the time. We just don't hear about it. The fact that this has been leaked before it's happened is a real embarrassment because now you've got that whole debate should they pay it should they not pay it how much of you know how idiotic are they going to look if they do pay it what are the ramifications going to be 
so fair play to the person who leaked it I think for it's just something we should know really that this is happening and quite rightly so many fans of football across the nation are wound up by it and rightly so for all those reasons you explained we've, we've mentioned how wealthy the guy is anyway wouldn't it be a much better gesture to give that money to a charity or give that money to a grassroots cause what Richard Scudamore should have come out and said straight away is I will not take this money I will be donating to this this and this but as far as I'm aware he has yet to do that it could still happen um, we, we wait mean, and see he seems like a decent enough bloke so hopefully he will but it, it comes across as greedy and this is the wider point I wanted to finish with really is it's very much a societal thing now I think not just in sport not just in this country either it's very much an us and them syndrome people see your elite your rich at the top handing out these massive payments to each other as parting gifts as any kind of gift really and you just feel so disenfranchised and disjointed from that world. And it just sums up a lot of fans' feelings with the Premier League. And that it's just become this huge bubble that has become out of reach for a lot of people because they can't afford it. And it's this totally different world where the players, they're, they're not, you see them flashing their wealth a lot of the time. And you don't feel that you can relate to them in any sort of way. But then what we mentioned earlier about the Calgary referendum on the 2026 Olympics. And the quote there was that, people were tired of the establishment and one last Brexit reference look at Brexit arguably the same thing that's why I think maybe it's a societal thing that we're seeing going on this us and them syndrome well if you're going political we you have to look at countries like Sweden as well which are going more to the extreme more to the right and it, I think people are at the moment like you're saying just being fed up of told what to do it's also you said you talked about an us and them mentality there's also that split within the Premier League as well. There's the top six and everyone else. So there's another us and them, if you like. So going back to Dinage coming in, she's got to deal with this as well. Like, It's just... Hopefully it will just sort of iron itself out. If I stick my head in the sand like an ostrich and wake up 20 years down the line, it'll all be fine. Probably won't be, but um, yeah. It's just... It's okay what it is at the moment, but it just has the ramifications of of going wrong and creating this European Super League, which we already have in the Champions League, don't we? Subscribe to our YouTube channel to find our episodes and other video content. Right, that is nearly it for this episode of the podcast. As ever, you can follow us on our social media channels. Uh, all of our handles are SportsBuildPod, so we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we're also on Instagram, so you can go and find our updates. We'll keep you updated on things like who our guests are, our podcast, and when, when we will be next back, so go and follow us there. Um, you can also get in touch with us on our email address. That is sportsbillpod at gmail.com. So whatever is on your mind, fire it to us and we will respond. One of us will respond. We are next back with a full episode on the 9th of December, which is three weeks from now, primarily because I am working the weekend shift on the 1st and 2nd of December. So that's why we can't do an episode then. Other messages. How's your motastic November going? Yep, as we said previously, it's going well. I'll have a, a little bit of a shave when I get back, put a new photo up on Insta and Twitter. So if you look for my handle, there should be links to sponsor me. If you would like to there, please do. It's a fantastic cause. Obviously, we've done our mental health specials. We've opened up on the podcast. So that's why I'm raising money to help men like the, the, in the positions that we, we've been in previously who need that little bit of help and support so please donate it's yes. a fantastic cause so, you know, a very very worthy cause and something I would also do if I could grow a moustache still waiting for that to actually happen <laughs> no growth whatsoever on my top lip and with that listeners it's a big thank you as always for tuning into our episode it is a goodbye from me it's goodbye from Will and until next time we will see you very soon